well-known critique against the Book of Abraham. Mormonism, most of you know, has four books of scripture, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Pearl of Great Price is the Book of Abraham. So Chuck's gonna talk about how that, uh, the translation work that Joseph Smith did was a complete failure and shows how he was a, a false prophet. Chuck also j told me, he just came out with this new book, uh, oh, yes. Destroying Angel. Yes. Right? A novel. Right. And uh, you, I don't know anything about it except that you just <laughs> wrote that, so you'll tell us about that. And then you have another one there on... Oh, yeah. Numismatic forgery. Coin forgeries. I know that you're really into coins. Yes. So. Well, I really thank Chuck for coming and sharing with us. And uh, feel we'll, ha we'll have a time of uh, question and answers, too. So, But I want to let Chuck just have take his time as long as you want. Like I said, we have an hour for the video, and then you can take as long as you want. Okay. So think of questions that you may want to be asking Chuck. And uh, hey, we're again happy for you to be here. Well, thank you. Somebody, so. somebody, go and time me, okay? Because it's it's better than having people just fall asleep or walk out or whatever. So <laughs> I don't want to go on too long. All right. Well, my name is Charles Larson. Okay, and I'm a former Mormon. You're all supposed to say hi, Charles. <laughs> hi, Charles. Charles. All right. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself first, okay, and how I got here. Try. I'll try to speak up. But like I say, I have a soft voice. And uh, <clears throat> okay, I was a convert to the LDS Church uh, when I was 19 years old. I had been a Christian for a number of years. I was saved when I was a child and thought I had a pretty good background as a as a Christian, but nothing that I had ever learned as a Christian could prepare me for someone coming and telling me that there was more, there was more to it, and that all of the Christianity and the love of God and the scriptures that I had been learning was really just God's way of preparing me to receive this fuller truth that was sitting there waiting for me. That was the, that was the hook, and I took the bait. So I was a young man in the army, trying to live a Christian life, and the only other person that I came across that was doing the same thing was a fellow in the bunk next to me that had been a Mormon for about a year. So I began going to church with him and he gave me some very strange books to read and uh, so I read them and began to just, well I thought I was investigating. You, you've been through that some of you? I thought I was investigating but what I was really doing was I was sitting through very carefully choreographed sales presentations and being fed all of the answers that I needed to go ahead and, and put in and respond. And, and coming from a Christian background, that's exactly what the sales presentation was geared toward. So I sincerely jumped right into it with both feet, and I became a Mormon. I got baptized, and I was so excited about it and wanted to share it with all my friends who weren't that impressed. Uh, neither was my family, but uh, that's a whole other story. Well. So I, I lived as a Mormon, and I lived as a conscientious, believing Mormon, and after about six months or so, I found out that Mormons believed that God had been a man once, and that men became just like God. And I thought, oh my gosh, somebody is spreading a terrible heresy through the ward, and I better go talk to the bishop and let him know this. So I went and made a fool of myself in front of the bishop, and he <laughs> gave me the old milk before meat type line, and I thought, oh, well, if if all of these people that I trust believe this, then it must be fine because I trust them. So again, I, I would take that one more step at a time. And I think that most people in Mormonism, whether they're converts to it or whether they're born in it and raised as children through it or are exposed to it at some point in their life, they do it the same way. They first of all accept that which they see which is good and comfortable around them and adds to their life, gives them values or enhances the values they already have and then they begin adding things to it and because you've accepted something you accept something else and I can very easily now understand why people in the 19th century were willing to accept polygamy were willing to go ahead and 
and participate in Mountain Meadows, were willing to do whatever was expected of them if they believed that they trusted the people that were telling them to do it. Well, but not to get too historical there, I was a Mormon then for a long time and I, uh, when I got out of the Army I went to BYU. I uh, met a young lady there, married in the Mantai Temple and began raising a family and working in the area and uh, I, I never did escape from Utah as a matter of fact. After about seven or eight years though, I decided to go back to school and finish my degree. And uh, I was feeling a hunger. It was a spiritual hunger. I thought I was being a good Mormon. I believed everything I was told. I was paid my tithing. I did everything I was supposed to, filled all of my callings. But I missed something. I missed the personal relationship that I used to have with Christ. Oh, Christ was still there. His name was on the building. Okay, I mean, if I had any doubts, you know, they even made the wording bigger. But I was more concerned with doing my priesthood ordinances and holding my priesthood and making sure that, uh, that I, I kept the word of wisdom and then obey this law, obey that law, than I was with fostering my relationship with Jesus Christ. I tried reading the scriptures and I've been through the Book of Mormon five or six times. It's funny that whenever you seem to be having a crisis, they always recommend the Book of Mormon. They never point you toward the Bible. And uh, I think there's a very good reason for that. But anyway, I, I felt a hunger. And so going to school at the time and supporting my family, I took a job as a night watchman. And at night, I would listen to Christian radio. You know, things coming out of Los Angeles, you know, and I recognized some of the hymns that hadn't had the words changed. And it was great to listen to them again. And I just felt wonderful listening to, to these sermons and, uh, and the music. Finally, I remember one day on, on BYU campus walking into the Joseph Smith building and seeing pictures on the wall of pyramids and ruins and things like that in Central America and Mexico meant to give the impression that these are Nephite ruins from Nephite civilizations. And I had just come from a class on Mesoamerican studies and anthropology where I'd, I'd learned that those were, were ruins from the 11th century and they were a totally different culture and they weren't Book of Mormon. And I thought, why would they do this? I, I could pick up a paperback Book of Mormon and find the same silly pictures in the front of it trying to give people the impression that, oh, this book talks about lost civilizations, here's the proof of the civilization. It had nothing to do with it. I, I should probably mention that as a, as a convert, I was, uh, I was a kind of a, a pain to a lot of bishops and so forth because I kept asking a lot of questions. I, I had this, this righteous fire of the convert where I wanted to know everything so that I could prove it to anybody else that asked. So naturally I wanted to know about all of the objections that there were to Mormonism and the right way to answer them, you see. Mm -hmm. So I began reading, well first I began reading the, uh, the works by the apologists, people like uh, 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 Hugh Nibley and, and well, uh, he's the one that comes to mind now, but there were Sterling and Learn, many of them, okay. And uh, some of them were kind of old works at the time, this was the early 70s. but. Uh, problems that I came across with that were that everything that everything was so pat it seems like the apologist would go ahead and take a ridiculous premise and a statement that some anti-Mormon had made and then go to demolish it and prove the person wrong and therefore the church is true and you can feel good about it. Well I felt great about that for a long time you know, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to go and, and prove that the Mormon church was true to anybody that, that you know, endangered their way across my path. Well, this takes you now to my experience at BYU, seeing those buildings and thinking to myself, why does it take a deception or a lie or, or just something that isn't accurate to try to prove something to someone? Why do you have to create that impression? If the evidence is there, give them the evidence. So I began looking into what evidence there was, and there wasn't any. I couldn't find any evidence. I, I would read books by people who claimed that there was evidence, and 
by that time, I guess I'd gotten some critical thinking underway because nothing seemed to really gel like it could be accepted by anyone else. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about the way that I think, okay? I think that if there is scientific evidence for something, a factual evidence, that it should be persuasive. That should be all it would take, is, is looking at it, and a reasonable person with a reasoning mind should be able to interpret that evidence and draw the only correct conclusion from it, from that evidence. Therefore, if there's evidence for the Book of Mormon, then every historian and every anthropologist and every archaeologist on earth should be amazed that this book came out before all of this stuff was proven, and they would all be Mormons, wouldn't they? Well, they weren't. That bothered me. And of course, at the same time now, I'm getting all of this input from Christian radio, and God working on my heart. Say, so, get back here, get back here, get back here. What I did, I finally did something that I never did as an investigator when I was taking missionary discussions. I gave myself the right to ask questions. I'm convinced that until a Mormon does that, you can throw things at them, you can throw facts and ideas and tracts and discussions and everything else until they give themselves the right to ask questions. None of it will work. Once I gave myself the right to ask questions, I just said, God, I just want to know what the answers are. I don't care what they are. Of course, I really suspect you're going to show me that the Mormon church is true and everything will be fine and, and I'll keep my marriage together and my children and everything will be happy. But, you know, even if worse comes to worse and it turns out that I'm wrong, at least I'd like to know. So that was my prayer. I wanted to know. So I didn't think at the time that anyone had ever looked into Mormonism and been able to prove that it wasn't true. This is 19, um, oh, late, late 1970s, okay? Very young, very naive. I'd been cloistered for, for several years in Mormonism and, and really didn't know what was out there. So I did something that took a lot of guts. I contacted a Baptist pastor called him up and I said, I'm a Mormon, I have some questions, I have some doubts. Do you know of anything that I could read that could answer my questions, that might even be able to show that Mormonism isn't true? And he said, come on over, I've got something for you. So I went over, we talked a little bit, he didn't try to go and get me to you know, say a sinner's prayer or anything like that, he just he was a very nice man, and he gave me two books. One of them was a, a little book called Joseph and the Golden Plates, and I can't even remember who it's by. It was a, just a little paperback book, the type that you would buy in a, in a small bookstore at the time, and, and I thought that was kind of interesting. It, it talked a little bit about uh, the Book of Mormon, and it talked a little bit about uh, uh, you know what was supposed to be in it, and the fact that nobody's ever found anything matching it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, let, Let's look at this other book. That he gave me. I picked up this big phone book with a plastic cover called Mormonism Shadow or Reality. <laughs> <laughs> Teeny tiny little type in two columns, yeah. 800 pages. And I started reading. It took me six days to read Mormonism Shadow or Reality. Whoa, that, that's amazing. Cover to cover. By the end of that six days, yes. I knew that Mormonism <laughs> wasn't true. Well, I rested on the seventh. I go. So. <laughs> okay. So I knew that. Now I had this terrible secret. Meanwhile, thank God, I was still going closer to restoring my relationship with God. So I didn't throw that baby out with the bathwater like so many people, unfortunately, do.